data is like the new oil. But then also on the operational side for private equity companies too, like how are we protecting ourselves? How are we ensuring ourselves? How are we calibrating risk? And all of this is just because real estate's everywhere, you know, the data that is the spine of all this information is really just kind of what we're slowly starting to see like a data renaissance. Today on the show, I have the pleasure of speaking with Jasmine Nazari. Now, Jasmine joined Urban Green in early 2013 after attending the University of California at Davis, where she got her MS in soils and biochemistry. Her focus evolved from operational work, and now she specializes in investor relations and supports Urban Green during the acquisitions process. She's a licensed real estate broker, a chartered financial analyst. She also is fluent in four languages, and she has a bilingual bachelor laureate, which is absolutely incredible. So to say that uh, I'm definitely not the smartest person person in the room, but I'm really excited to have her on the show today to share her incredible story and what she's up to. But enough of me, let's get her out here. G'day, Jasmine. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Hi, Reed. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I love what oh. you do and thank you. Yeah, well, hey, great to have you on the show. And just for those people listening, uh, Jasmine and I are going to be on stage at the Ironman conference in uh, New York on June 11th uh, for the AI and real estate. So if you are listening, you are in New York and you hear this podcast, you want to get along, get your tickets, and I have to give a plug for IMN because that's how we got uh, introduced. But with that being said, I ask everyone who jumps on this show, rewind the clock and tell me how you made your first ever dollar as a kid. I will tell you my first ever dollar came from savings. Um, not the most interesting story, but the the way that our family works is you work really hard. And then once a year, it's in Persian, and uh, we have this Persian New Year, where it's once a year and you get gifts and it's often signed uh, in our family. It was in a book and it was signed and then I would save it. And um, I saved and saved and saved so much that by the time I was in college, I actually was like, uh, I had the gift of being able to sponsor a little girl that my aunt has an, or sorry, random segue here, but my aunt has an orphanage in India. And uh, mm. I really fell in love with one little girl that she had at the school. And so I I would um had the ability to contribute to her little advancement. And she's a she's a star today. That's so. awesome. That's incredible. Yeah. Uh yeah. I can already tell you've got a deep knack for you have four languages. You're very you seem to be very worldly. You're very well educated. So how did you come from biochemistry and soils, uh, as we were joking in the green room before, I'm a, I'm a former civil engineer and uh, I had spent many a times on the back of a drill rig getting soil samples out of uh, yeah. minings, my, my tailings dams, I should say. So how did you make that transition into real estate and, and away from your biochemistry and all that sort of stuff? Totally. I graduated and I, I think I, you, you're right. I am, I am worldly. I consider myself very, very lucky to be able to connect with people. I'm very open. I have a very open heart and I just share myself and more people to share myself and to connect, like feel the better. And then, um, so I graduate and I'm like, I'm, you know, I, I've fallen in love with my master's program. And I was like the, the director's report or the, the chair of the department's like report for graduate students. I was like the the girl of the program or anyway, I graduate and I'm like, okay, world, like I'm ready. Like who wants me? And I graduate and I'm like the, the, uh, and obviously you have connections and you work those relationships, but you're like, I don't want to go work for, I'm not going to work for, sorry to uh, put a company down, but these companies that genetically modify, like that's not my, I'm not going to speak badly about it, but that's not the part of the food system I want to be a part of. Um, it's necessary, but I want to be a part of the other side. And those, that other side, the organic side was, you know, missing like three orders of magnitude on the, the, the comp. I was like, the zeros were in the wrong place. So uh, as I said earlier, I often joke, I'm, I'm Persian and the, 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 we're very driven and aggressive and, and sweet. Um, and we want to, you know, um, deserve at least the money pulled harder, basically. So I, I applied to soils engineering jobs and then sustainability jobs because I had some experience with um, calibrating sustainability for our university. And then I, um, my family's in real estate and I remember changing like dishwashers and, you know, repairing stuff and washing screws with my, my dad and Home Depot was the jam. And you know, my, my family and my mom on the accounting side. So I always had, I always say real estate was at the family table. 
Um, I didn't have any siblings, but I, I uh, applied for a real estate position and I am extremely lucky and I landed upon um, the Cornerstone or slash the McCluskey family who kind of took me on as like an honorary um, member of their uh, family office. And then their beautiful son, David, is my CEO, kind of really took me on as as I was I was an assistant to them and they they saw potential in me. And um, that's the, it just clicked. Like we just clicked. So that's I'm awesome. extremely lucky, but I would highly, highly recommend that um, you find a, a group with a strong working chemistry that you can, you can directly impact um, and learn, you know, balance between um, comp and learning and, you know, find your right one. Well, look, you're not the only one who's been on this show. Uh, my, my, my background as well as in engineering, but a lot of like science, scientists, engineers find themselves in real estate because it's very uh, problem solving. You have to break it apart and put it back together again. And so that mindset really is driven a lot of the founders that have come on this show. So, you know, your story is not unique, but but certainly from a biochemistry point of view, which I do want to dive into in your, uh, we, we mentioned some of the, the passions, but your perception of AI, like everyone's talking about AI right now. The reason we got you on the show and I think you're really passionate about is is how AI in real estate uh, is, is going to converge. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe let's set the scene beforehand and, and talk about, you know, I've been in real estate for over a decade. It's the wild, wild west when it comes to tech. <laughs> it's very, very in the old school days of like I Fred know. Flintstone. And, and I call it the dinosaur. It's like yes. the dinosaur yes. that doesn't take one step, but it's slowly, I don't, we'll talk, I mean, anyway, we'll talk in, in a moment, continue. Yeah, no, but we're like, but the example of, I, I th always think was when I got started in this, in this space, like DocuSign was the most advanced <laughs> thing since, since sliced bread, right? And now we've got so much SaaS products that if you don't have, uh, you know, all the, 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 the co-stars and the online portals for, for people, and it's now like really nearly over -sassed. And And obviously now you layer on AI in terms of that. Real estate still has a very much mano a mano type of that, that interface. But give me your perception of, of the last, you've been involved in, with Urban Green since 2013. Like what's your perception been of the technology space and, and how we're evolving as an industry, given the dinosaur, you know, lens we're coming through uh, looking at this with? Right. I, I think that, and a girlfriend of mine and I had deep conversations about this, but it's, I think data is like the new oil. So it's like the new, in the new thing that we're really, and oil is a really interesting metaphor to use because it's both lubricating, you know, pun not intended, but it's also very like um, heavy in real estate, right? Because one thing I absolutely love about real estate is that it's absolutely everywhere. It's in every city you go, it's every place you go, it's every, whether you're in a sports arena, whether you're in a, um, I mean, I'm not going to use infrastructure, but kind of infrastructure is kind of a real estate play. Um, whether you're in a, an office building or whatever, there, it's all real estate. And then you think about, you know, when I was a kid driving around, how did people buy these? Like, how, how did people build the, I know my family is affluent in its own beautiful way, but how are these larger things built? And really you can see kind of how real estate and society go hand in hand, real estate and our, the places we, they say that the, the buildings you live, you know, they shape you and same thing for a city. Um, so kind of back to your question of like how AI and, and oil and all this stuff's going on. I think that we're really going to be starting to see like this changes everywhere within the next, I think, 10 years, both in, on the brokerage side, um, in, in real estate valuations, on the debt side, the, the documents that are going to be available. There's a couple cool companies I can do a shout out to, but then also on the operational side for private equity companies too. Like, how are we protecting ourselves? How are we insuring ourselves? Um, how are we calibrating risk? Um, and all of this is just because real estate's everywhere, you know, the data that that um, is the spine of all this information is really just kind of what we're slowly starting to see, like a, a data renaissance. And your command of that, your ability to, um, you know, assess the, the, the quality of that data um, and then move accordingly or act accordingly is really the art, I think, of our next, um, like the the art of this renaissance, I think, that we're feeling that we're in right now. It's not going to be like the past where it's like an old boys club. Sorry, no offense to the men. Men have been 
beautiful and so welcoming to me as a woman in this industry, just especially my team. Yeah, I just, I really do think that um, we're at this very interesting turning point um, in how relationships are going to be affecting our investment decisions and then how data is also going to be changing how we even approach those relationships. We're going to be doing it in a more sophisticated way. Data is the new oil. I think that's a definitely the, the soundbite of this interview because it's changed so much. And you think about what it is what it represents, right? Data is knowledge, right? When you have knowledge, you have more power, you can make better decisions. And that, you know, when it break, breaks it down to it, you know, that is the sort of the oil element of what makes a car run or what makes the world go around or what makes, right. um, you know, products out of oil. And to that is like how how the world goes around, how things operate, but also how we make, inv- um, both on the, the sponsor side, how we make investment decisions, how and how our investors find us, um, and just, I think there, there, it's, it's, it's going to be kind of turned inside out. The question where I was going with this mm-hmm. was like, what are you using in every day with, with Urban Green that has changed over the? Like I mentioned DocuSign before, I jokingly mentioned that, but like, and now there's online portals and ways to capture more data. There's even, you know, we have bots that try and track, uh, track or att- attract, I should say. Uh, leads to our multifamily properties, you know, like there's there's been a, a real breadth in the last 10 years of a chain, like a complete, you know, as you said, a renaissance. What are you using today in Urban Green that you didn't use, say, 10 years ago? Mm-hmm. Right. I think we have been huge fans, huge fans of Juniper Square. They changed my life, the way our company works. They're like an extension of our team, really. They're just exceptional um, and we were, we were their, I think their seventh client and, um, we're extremely lucky to have been able to grow in an outsized way and in, in a disproportionate or non-commensurate way compared to what, uh, we would have been able to, had they not existed. Um, we worked, we've worked with crowd street in the past. They're great. Um, we worked with Fundrise as well, you know, great that they've pivoted towards the more fun space crowd street too. Um, there's a cool company that we are working with as well called Lev on the, um, on the leverage side where they're, um, basically, uh, I would say they're like debt brokers, but on steroids, it's, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal product. I highly recommend, uh, actually you'll be, you'll be seeing Lev at the IMN conference again, shout out to IMN. They gave me so many, (laughs) so many opportunities. Um, of course, for asset management, there's tools like Stessa and DealPath and Deal Cloud that we've used and dabbled with. But I think I also, you know, what I personally believe is in that evolution of the last 10 years, and I want your opinion on this, is we've nearly got sassed out. Like, I think I mentioned that earlier. Like, I'm just like, uh, I've got to spend another $25,000 on another bloody piece of software that I have to run. Like, at the end of the day, like, even as complex as you want to make real estate, it's down sure. to you make money when you buy. And how do you make sure you have a product priced, whether it be rentals or price per square foot on office space or retail or whatever it might be, that is attractive to someone to come and rent from you because you're you're, you're obviously renting a space away. Um, I, I don't think you ever lose that touch with the basics of real estate. Right. Would you agree? That's a big thing I love about, again, Urban Green is we are pretty close to the real estate. There's not It's not like a fund and then the fund has these you know, it's not an open-end fund where it's all these complicated structures. No, we point to that building. We tell our investors we're going to that building. Would you like to join us in that building? And then we visit that building over and keep a close, you know, where it's like one of, it becomes like a little kid of ours. I do love the access to, um, particularly with AI coming on, like uh, I, I was t- uh, chatted with hellodata.ai, a big shout out mm-hmm. to them, a uh, relatively new company, but like, you know, CoStar has been, apartments.com, like these these SaaS companies have been around for many, many years have, who have got the lion's share of, of the marketplace. Yes. I, I see AI also coming in and disrupting them in a way that is, you don't have to go pay the $25,000 a year. The data is all available um, and and you can go get it easily. Like, and I can go, I was looking at Hello Data the other day and they, they give you like a bit of an underwrite of, and I tested one of my deals and I was like, it's not that far off in terms of they produced a P&L for me. And I was like, it's a little lower, but like, you know, well done for, for something that is just grabbing, that doesn't have access to my actual right. PL and financials to give it to use the other information around it, the other rental comps, the other expense comps, and com, uh, compile that data together. 
that's pretty powerful at the, at the click of a button. Uh, right. It's pretty also pretty scary to say like where you're a private real estate investment company, you don't share your financials because you're a small company, and all of a sudden this AI company is like boom, it's you know within ten percent. You're like, well, I'll give it to you. <laughs> it, was it, was, it was attracting. So you said hello, a hello. What was it? Hello AI. Hello data dot AI. Hello data AI. So. Oh. Back to sort of the the fundamentals of, of real estate and you know the mano mano and and just trying to make make a deal work because on the other side like investors and I've seen this as well and interviewed a lot of crowdfunding with the 2012 Jobs Act and the crowd street funding you know boom that happened in 2014 2015 2016 which has led a little bit to the frothiness and the bubble that we've just come through and it probably popped in commercial real estate right. um, but on the investor side I still don't see that you know, euphoric, I'm cruising the internet, I'm going to go invest $100,000 into some random person's, uh, you know, thing I find online. Have you still found investors want to touch and feel the real estate, touch and feel you guys, make sure you're real? Because these are big, big dollars, big bets that are being made in right. whether it's data center or multifamily or whatever. Has that has that changed a lot for you guys in at, at Urban Green over the last, you know, 13, 14 years? Yeah, we've spoken about, we were just talking about that yesterday as a team, for instance, like we're thinking, like I, I do think like within the next 10 years or maybe this next generation will have a different relationship with investing and maybe they'll learn the hard way, the importance of a handshake, the importance of like actually, because there's not the same hedging, you know, like with stocks, there's the liquidity element and that's kind of, so just three parts of my answer. One is hello, Dada. AI is a great one. There's also another company, Archer, that does this, a really yep. good job here. Second thing is, is I think the opposite side of this, like um, this conversation about how people will be assessing investments and calibrating investments is the people are expecting, they have some tolerance for real estate, especially if it's larger check sizes, they have patience for the business plan. But really, I don't think this future generation is going to have the same patience mm, that prior generations have necessarily had with real estate, they understand the, um, not to generalize, I'm not saying everyone in Gen Z has a short attention span. No, far from it. They're probably the wiser of us, but um, between me and them, but I'll say that they're, um, they may not have the same patience for business plans. They, or I don't know, that's, that there's like an education yes. element there, right? Yes. Yeah, so um, say, say more about that because that's, that is interesting how we have come and like, I've bought and sold massive multifamily properties in two years and double people's money. Like we've come out of a, a bit of a bubble as well where we set expectations for investors and they're like, oh, we're at year three of uh, the business plan. You ready to sell yet? And you're like, guys, no, historically real estate is medium to long term. And I think we're shifting back to that. But yeah. to your point, sprinkle in newer generations who don't have the patience or maybe ex have an expectation because they got in the last cycle that they're like, oh, you, why are we flipping out of this in two years and doubling my money and making uh, outsized returns? So Say more about that because I think that that is important yeah. about patience. Yeah, I think that laced with like um, state level laws around like housing and stuff that's going on in California and the opposite in Florida the, and New York. You know, we are going to see kind of like some adjustments to expectations. Maybe I'm completely wrong about this, but I do think while the education element is happening around real estate, the li illiquidity. Maybe two interesting places to look are secondary markets. If someone with tokenization, with Bitcoin, is a part of a conversation about the future generation there, I think uh, especially they may just be really interested in renting and having independent and free lifestyles. And they'll maybe will, maybe they'll be able to or be willing to create like a more pooled investment and a predetermined secondary position that they're, or, um, sorry, liquidity that they're willing to take in order to get their capital back. I don't know if that's necessarily something private equity is ready for or, or mm. private equity real estate is bracing itself for, but that would be an interesting place to look. I also think I've said this, my, our teams discuss this a lot, but this like matchmaking element, it really is like matchmaking, like an investor with liquidity at that time, looking for exactly that kind of investment with that amount of cash finds this sponsor who's in doing that exact same thing. It's kind of like this magic, magic, um, magical matchmaking. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's necessarily efficient, <laughs> right? It's not. No, <laughs> no, no, it isn't. And I think both on the broker side, that's very, those are large fees that they're paid for this matchmaking service and same thing for capital introduction groups. 
Um, these are large fees that I think they're ready for tech disruption. There, there you go. Following on from that, it's it, it, around the the Jobs Act, which I, I point back to as yeah. a, quite a pivotal moment in. Yeah. I know I've only been involved in real estate for a bit over a decade, but it has you been. Should. For for a access for people to come and start soliciting investments online and the crowdfunding and the AI and access to data and quick 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 I want all this to happen like tomorrow tomorrow tomorrow, um, it 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 is a bit of a what's I'm trying to think of the word it's a disruption but it's also causing problems at the same time because it's run really quickly, and if you look at you know how. I remember sending out emails and getting you know ten million dollars funded in like two weeks. It's like that's insane, right? Today like you're trying to draw blood out of a stone. And that's also meant that there's a lot more eyeballs in the lane of commercial real estate. There's a lot more people doing what it is. And so it becomes very crowded. And so how do you stand out? And how do you attract that investor? How do you attract that deal? And it's it's uh, all questions I don't have the answers for, but I, but I want to know your, your two cents on that because it, it, yeah. is a crowded, it is a crowded field. When you think of this, the spectrum from SaaS to attracting investors to finding the best deal to making that matchmaker and all of the above. Yeah. Our um, CEO is pretty brilliant in his response and it's elegant and it's just results. You know, we can, all we can do is just focus on the results that we bring in and just keep drawing our attention to that progress on our deals and results on our deals. You know, NOI is up. We're not selling right now, like just fundamentals. Um, and those are things that we can point to as like directly our, our responsibility and our, our, as our fiduci- responsibility as a uh, fiduciary for our investors. That's like what we point to. Um, the bigger stuff, the larger like fingers on the scale that are being put, you know, headwinds, tailwinds, those those sorts of conversations. We can only point to the results that we are responsible for and just back to fundamentals with that. Because yeah, differentiating ourselves, we, we have knock on wood, knock on wood, no issues with really relaying our... Um, progress with with investors. Yeah, there there's a little bit of patience right now. Yeah, because they expected their money back yesterday, but there's really no fires that we we kind of have to put out. Differentiating ourselves is just keep pointing to to results. It works, but it also comes back to patience and yeah. building that results takes time. Like it's there's a chicken right. and the egg scenario. Like you can't just start a firm tomorrow and be like, yeah. wait on my results. It's like, well, there's no deals to be had. How do I go get the results? You know, like it's, um, it's it, but where, you, where do you think we are in the cycle right now? And are you guys bullish on, on buying uh, in today's market with higher interest rates? Uh, an answer that I like to give is, is I'm bound to be right and I'm bound to be wrong at the same time for in answering this. So if you watch this in 2026 or 2024, you know, I, I'm going to look differently, but depending on where the rest of the cycle con- or how the cycle continues. But at this point, depending on the asset type and the location, I think we are very hungry and our investors are too. We're, we're, we're pencils up always. As, as I said earlier, I think this is a very sophisticated distress situation where there's gap capital as a solution, there's rescue capital, there's there is preferred that people are able to lean on to not, you know, have fire fires that they need to put out. Um there's not you, sorry, just just on the do you think that's propping up an inevitable crash that should Absolutely. have happened? Absolutely. I think the biggest thing that the the type of real estate that will be caught in this that that took takes the biggest, you know, hit is going to be office, but multifamily and industrial will be the golden children forever and the bell of the ball for the foreseeable future. And they have the tax advantages to boot. Yeah, I think office will be the one to see um, some corrections. I'm trying to think, what are some other types of real estate that are got worth, your far, Farmland is a little bit different, but you do have retail, which is mm-hmm. around, you know, the, the human psyche of are people living in the city? Do they need the retail? Do they need to be in an urban center? Are they more working from home? So they're in the you know the suburbs and all that sort of stuff. So I think it's 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 interesting. Um, my two cents on it, for right. what it's worth, and for everyone whoever gives a crap while you listen I to this do. podcast, uh, um, is more around. I think you know, I'm in multi. I've been in multi for, for for many years. We have seen a correction, and it's gone down twenty to thirty percent. I think it's a great time to be buying right now. The problem that I see is: do investors want to go, double down in that space again, or do they want to see something different from an operator? And as an operator, 
everyone says stick to your lane, stick to your lane, stick to your lane. And, and it was interesting to hear that Urban Green has got multiple lanes, which is probably going to lead me to my segment. My, 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 my next question is mm-hmm. you know, where, where we'll be. And you can't just sit in the corner and suck your thumb and wait for the, the, the market to come back when we've been in a bit of a barren land for the last two years, let's call it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and 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 you know, truth be told, I think we've been in more of a recession than what we've been let on for. Look at my renters who are blue collar; they can't pay rent. They mm-hmm. delinquency's been up. We're starting to see that change a little bit in the last quarter, call it. But all of 2023 and most of 2022, it has been dire. Yeah, uh, like a lot of evictions, a lot of people struggling. Everyone's paying the same at the gas pump, and I'm just like. It's good, but then on the investment side, people are getting whacked. The people are handing back keys right now, and I, I like I don't like that. I've never, mm-hmm. I, I don't have grey hair. I've not been th- through two thousand eight, but this feels like a two thousand eight scenario, in in the in the specific sectors, office potentially multifamily. There could be some overbuild and in, industrial, depending on where you look. But mm-hmm. it may not necessarily be a fundamental problem, but it's a debt problem, and that's been right. a wide opening. The, the U.S. economy will shift and it can crush you if they raise interest rates from 0% where you borrowed at, now they're at 5 and now you have to borrow at 9%. If you didn't underwrite for that, you're all screwed. I don't care how yeah. good of an underwriting you are. So anyway, two, two cents on that before we wrap up the show. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, we we were fortunate to buy interest rate caps, but those aren't in term, those aren't, in, you know, those are, those have terms themselves. So um, I know I always joke with um with with our team and kind of our some investors like call the Fed, like make your make your call, call the Fed. Like yeah. let's let's do this. Let's let's go J Money let's, Pal, let's go, man. Exactly. <laughs> let's dial, let's let's do it. Like what could we do? Right. right. What could we do? No, it, it but it is a lesson, right? You have to take stock of like what we talked about, this whole thing, disruption and things will change and there's a lot of frothiness and people coming into the industry and that's causing Inflated prices or whatever, and then the Fed does what the Fed does. You, you, at the end of the day, we are all human. We, we don't control the world. And you have to just, if you've made a decision and it doesn't turn out great, you've got to live with it, but learn from that decision. You know, one right. of the things we, right. we, we are executing on deals today, but it's only fixed rate and it's only agency, right? Mm-hmm. Investors want to see that. And making sure you're buying at good basis, that you have a long-term vision and you can show a long-term plan, I think is really, really important. So, yeah. um uh, Jasmine, at the end of every show, we do want to get into the top five investing tips. But just before we do, yes. give me a quick synopsis, 30-second pitch of where Urban Green is headed in the next 24 months. I would say we're long on office. I would mm-hmm. say that we're um, aiming to get back into some markets that we were, uh, well, I'll just say we're, we're, we've always been agnostic to to the location and to the asset types. I'll just say we're we're excited to be transacting, hopefully again in some places that have, you know, entered like delusion territory with those cap rates. So hopefully we'll start to see some corrections there. I think what we're what we're looking forward to is just for 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 the soft landing to occur. I don't know, if, you know, there's been some expectation about, uh, you know, how can this how 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 reasonable is it or how feasible is it? But to for a soft landing to actually occur. But I do think we're Again, if whatever I say is bound to be right and wrong at the same time. So for the next 24 months, I think we're looking to um, plant new seeds with new joint ventures, with new GPs, um, hopefully uh, long on office, um, trying to do more data center fiber optic deals, and then incorporate more operational efficiencies and kind of find ways, find stronger partners that we um, we want to work with. What about you? We just got a new deal on a contract in San Antonio, 80s okay. vintage product, blue collar. Like it's stuff where I've been transacting since 2014. Um, look, we, we just we think there's deals to be had today. It's it's about finding the right equity to partner with. I think that's the hard yes. part. Uh, I'm very bullish on manufacturing and very bullish on, um, and that's because of the de globalization. Uh, I'm very bullish on modular housing from a uh, efficiency point of view and a cost and, and, and waste point of view. So, looking at a couple of potential business ventures in that in that regard. Um, mm. But but in general, I still think the fundamentals of multifamily are there. It's just yeah. around trying to find the right deals and and, and back the right markets uh, and, and make sure you don't. You know, we all choked on cheap debt. Don't don't lesson learned. Don't do that again. You know, right, <laughs> I, 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 know. I hope I have to never buy a rate cap ever in my entire life. That's what yeah. I. That's that's my that's my future goal. So I know um, it's, it's right here. <laughs> yeah, we're. It's such a good. Um, I think we have a healthy relationship to it, but it's just a matter of for how long. Like ever, I feel like everyone's kind of been holding their breath, and the Fed did it so right. 
buy rate drops. And then, you know, they're like t- taking that back now. So that I bought them some time just to recalibrate and assess. And, you know, it's kind of been, um, Rip the bandaid off, I say. Let's just rip it off. Let's. Right. It's been a slow. It's been a slow moving ship for too long. It's like let's get in. Let's get into it. If we're going to have a problem, let's have a problem. I know. You know? I, I always say this Fed stuff is always everything is created in language. All drama is created in language. All investment decisions are often created in language. Um, the psyche is created in language, and so they're really. It's a, it's an interesting. Um, yeah, it's interesting dynamic. I love it. All right. At the end of every show, we love to dive in the top five investing tips. You ready to get into it? Please. Question number one, I don't want to hold out five because we haven't got the five yet. Now, question number one is what's the daily habit you practice to keep on track towards your goals? I have an amazing planner. It's called the best planner. Literally, it's right here. It's called the best planner ever. And it's huh. written by this woman named um, Jen- Jen- Jennifer Dawn. And I use this religiously. You set goals for the year. You break that down into a monthly goal. And then you break that. And then at the end of every month, you assess what works, what didn't work. What, who, what are you going to do? What are you going to delegate? What are you going to not do again? And then you create a plan for the year, for the month, and then you take that on every day. It reminds you to check on your overall vision for the year um, and your overall life vision kind of every day. So it's it's, it's been a game changer for me. Best planner ever, right? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Question number two is who's been the most influential person in your career? I I have to give that to our our CEO, David McCluskey, and, and, and also his dad, Tom McCluskey. But also, yeah, Dave, David has has given me so many of my chances. We've got to get David on the show, maybe. <laughs> get, get, see from his his side of the story. Um, okay. Question number three is, what is the most influential tool? You might have just mentioned it. But when I say tool, it could be a physical tool like your journal that you just mentioned, or it could be a piece of software back to the underlying theme of this show that you just can't run the business without. What is it? Um, I think Juniper Square for, for us because, A, they keep getting better B, they um, are, they have an incredible like um, commitment to security um, and then auditing basically like they, they, they have such a record keeping strong record keeping. So you can, you can always like verify your work. There's always so many human error friendly um, solutions that they have. And then third is, is that they're supporting some of the largest firms in the world and uh, they help smaller firms grow into the larger firms that they want to be. Um, and for that, I think that they're indispensable to how we operate um, and, and and respect our investors. Question number four is what, in one sentence, what has been the biggest failure and what did you learn from that failure in your career? I took a class and they said, failure doesn't exist. It's just a gap in performance. Um, it's a gap in performance and what are you going to do about it? But if I was to say a failure really quick, I just want to take a second. Yes. Our CEO has been incredibly formative and given me my chances, but there's also two more team members, sure. Barrett, Go ahead. Barrett Elmer and Amy Lynn. I, I, they have taught me, you know, cause there's no private equity school. There's no private equity real estate school. We're trying to build it with Academy of commercial real estate. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't exist. So that my team members have taught me everything from the soils girl, I, the hippie girl to the, you know, now I'm a, anyway, so I owe them tremendously for teaching me, uh, hum, hum, <laughs> uh, okay. That, that I had to say, I think in terms of failure, I don't know if I have, I, I would say that my, my biggest lesson, um, or the biggest thing I hold for myself is. Yeah, there's nothing I can't do. There's nothing I can't do. There's things that I won't do. There's things that I I have not done. But yeah, I don't know. I can't really identify with failure. Yeah, you don't have one thing. Well, we'll, we'll I'll get you on stage at IMN and we'll we'll have 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 an answer for me then. So um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, awesome. I think there's there's like two software I recommended that we implement. Um, and then they, those software firms themselves, kind of like didn't rise, didn't grow. So that was a big lesson. So like the software companies themselves were not as um, invested in themselves as I would have expected them to be. So I think my biggest failure was probably in not diligencing, although I kind of quarterbacked the trans, the, the, the um, migration or the, the implementation of those software. I do think that um, most important is going to be the integrity of the, the software themselves. Like how long are they going to be around for? Last question is where can people reach you to continue the conversation that will be in your sphere? Where do they go? Yeah, of course. Um, you can email me, jasmine at urban green and then inv.com. Oh, inv, gotcha. Okay. 
I N V. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. Thank you. Well, look, thank you so much for jumping on today's show. I just want to reflect some of the things that I took away from today's show. I think thank your you. uh, ability to, you know, look at the other side of the spectrum and see where the change is coming. Um, I, I, you know, it sounds like you've come from a more of a holistic background and bringing that into real estate investment and how that interfaces with AI and technology is super important and 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 bringing that cutting edge to your company and and pushing them in a direction to be you know more transparent find better investors use data to make better decisions I think it is such a, a thing that I can see that you're wanting to to ship your company within but also being aware of the other things that are outside we didn't even get into some of the vertical farming that we mentioned in the green room um, that I know you're super passionate about but also around people's expectations. And I wrote the word patience down here. Like that was such a thing that patience in investing in real estate, maybe people don't have because of the liquidity, but you got to find the right investors to match up and 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 the whole array of different um, uh, elements along the step along the stepping stones to get to a closed deal. You've got to have all the right partners from the broker to the finding the investor who wants to park their money and have the patience and then, you know, make sure that the business plan goes uh, according to, to plan. So, I took a lot away from today's show, but anything else that you want to add before we wrap? No, this was fantastic. Thank you, Reed. What a what an opportunity to like reflect and also be you know seen and heard and um, giving me a chance to like explore this conversation with you. Thank you for the the shout out to Hello Data uh, and uh, many other firms that I think you're you're really um, changing the way or like lowering the the um uh what's it called that people are should feel less inhibited you know they should feel more you know self-expressed and kind of uh safe to uh explore um you know betterment together thanks to you so oh, yeah thank you so much well look again enjoy the rest of your week it's been awesome coming on the show we'll see you in new york in a couple of weeks uh, at imn uh so thanks a lot for coming on the show thank you well, there you have another cracking episode jam-packed with some incredible advice from Jasmine. Remember, if you do want to check her, her out, remember, it's jasmine at urbangreeninv.com. And I'm sure she's also all over LinkedIn. And you can go to Urban search Urban Green Investments in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm sure it's going to come up. And if you are in New York City between June 10th and 11th, or it's 10th, 11th, 12th, uh, the IMN is having an AI, AI conference uh, interface with real estate. Do come along. You'll see both uh, Jasmine and myself on stage. Uh, come up and say g'day and get a bit of a selfie. I want to thank you all for taking some time out of the day to tune in to continue to grow your financial IQ because what we're all about here on the show. The easiest way to give back is to give it a five-star review on iTunes. And we're going to do this all again next week. So remember, be bold, be brave, and go give life a crack. Mm-hmm.